live from the WKRG News 5 studio. You're watching the Mobile City Council Candidate Forum for District 3. Sponsored by Mobile United, the League of Women Voters, and AFC Mobile. Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's City Council District 3 Forum. I'm Peter Albrecht. This is the fourth of seven City Council debates we're bringing you to get you ready for Mobile's election on August 24th. Our City Council debates are sponsored by the League of Women Voters, Mobile United, and Mobile AFC, our great soccer team here in the city. District 3 encompasses most of Maysville in the DIP area and more. The candidates are arranged tonight alphabetically, Xavier Carnreich and C.J. Small. Here are the ground rules for tonight. The candidates do not know the questions in advance. They'll have up to one minute for their answers. There will be no rebuttals. We ask the candidates to answer the question that's being asked. We will rotate the order in which the candidates answer the questions. And then at the end of our forum tonight, each candidate will be allowed to make a one minute closing statement. All right, we're gonna begin with some topics pertinent to District 3. We'll begin with the downtown airport situation. The city moving ahead with plans to move the commercial airport from Batesfield to Brookley in District 3. This could add more airplane noise to your district. Do you favor moving the airport? Why or why not? And Xavier, you're first. Um, yes, I do favor moving the airport because, um, <clears throat> Well, um, from what I can understand, it'd be easier to access. As far as the noise goes, well, I mean, you do have an airport. <laughs> All right, CJ? Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, uh, Peter, for the invitation on this evening. Uh, there are some pros and cons uh, with moving the airport down to Brooklyn Field. And I do favor moving the airport down in uh, Brooklyn Field because it's so close to Dolphin Island Parkway. Uh, the reason that is because what follows the airport would be more businesses such as hotels and rental cars. Um, the noise complaints is what you, that the question that you ask is that the noise is regulated now by the federal. So therefore, the planes are now designed with less noise mechanism and therefore the runway will be going across Mobile Bay and then that will make less noise into the community where many citizens have concerns about. Okay, thank you so much. We'll go from planes to trains and talk about Amtrak. The city has promised $3 million to help bring Amtrak service back to the area, but Amtrak has reneged on a promise to conduct a study on what impact the use of the tracks would have on commercial rail service, especially near the port. So the question tonight is, should Mobile subsidize the return of uh, Amtrak service? CJ, you go first. As long as all the agreements that was put up front has been made, Mobile should do. But if all the agreements is not met up front and what everybody said it was going to do, I don't believe that Mobile should go forth because if they renege on one thing, they'll renege on two. Okay, Xavier? Yes, I think it will be good for tourism, but at the same time, like CJ was saying, if they don't keep their end of the bargain, then, you know, we shouldn't work with them. All right, very good. Our next question involves the waterfront. What would you like to see uh, done in District 3 to make the waterfront more accessible to the public. Xavier, you're first. Um, ferry boats will be good. Um, and just general being able to transport and get to the locations. All right, CJ. Yes, in the past couple of years, the city of Mobile have purchased uh, two different properties. Uh, recent, the uh, city of Mobile have purchased the old Zabat property from malls. Uh, back in the day, there used to be a beach called Hippie Beach off the off and out of Parkway. Then after that, you know, malls took it over and had a sewage plant there. So the sewage plant was, is not there no more because of the hurricane. They've been sitting there idle for years. So recently the city had just purchased that uh, property for access for water for the citizens of Mobile. And also earlier this year, a lot of part of last year, the city along with the state of Alabama had also purchased the old Brooklyn uh, property, uh, USA property in Brooklyn. So therefore, there is more water access for the citizens of Mobile. So between the old Zabat property and the old USA, the old USA property, the city have more access to water. All right, thank you very much. Next question, what's your opinion of the state of public schools in District 3? And what, if anything, should the city be doing to work with the school system to make things better? CJ, you're first. Uh, currently, the schools, especially on Dolphin Auto Parkway, and I would go even say the ones in Maysville are, are really good. We have Gilyard, we have Pillins, we have BC Rain, along with Craighead um, and also Maryville Elementary School. 
All those schools are doing wonderful in the community. The city should invest into, uh, continue to invest into the public school system because again, those are our tomorrow. Those are our future workers here in the city of Mobile. So therefore, we need to go ahead and invest to make sure that we make sure we have good workers in the years to come. All right, Xavier. Um, yeah, I think that our school system is doing pretty well in our area. Just um, we should continue to focus on those schools and help them um, teach our future and everything and, you know, keep everything together. All right. We're going to talk uh, next about Ladd Stadium, technically, I think, in District 2, but close to District 3. Uh, South Alabama has moved out. The Senior Bowls moved out. The Lending Tree could move out. The high schools are all getting on-campus stadiums. What do you think uh, the future of LAD is? What would you like to see it be? Xavier, you're first. Well, I would like to see um, LAD Stadium become a historic landmark. If we don't use it anymore, if everything just moves out, then I would like to see it become a historic landmark. It's been here for a long time, and um, I used to live right around, a lot, right, right around the corner from itself. All right, very good. CJ? Yeah, LAD Stadium is a historical landmark, and we, the city, uh, should more, uh, invest more into it. Uh, to draw more games, uh, such as uh, historical black colleges and universities. Um, also, the lab board is currently trying to make it an entertaining venue, uh, just to have more than just football there. They want to have music concerts, you know, in the community. We need something that every community for the community, community can enjoy, especially in the Maysville area. Again, if you don't have anything in the community for citizens can enjoy, they will, look, they will feel like they just left out. But if you have things in the community, where citizens can enjoy it and they can just walk to, you know, that'd be a enjoyable things for the citizens in that particular area. All right, thank you very much. All right, we're gonna go on and talk about crime and policing in the city. Mobile on pace this year to have the highest number of murders in more than a decade. Many of these crimes are being committed by teenagers. What can be done from a city standpoint to address this problem? Uh, CJ, you're first. We have to continue to engage the citizens. Um, this past um, couple of years, the you know, Mobile City Council had, you know, put forth a, you know, citizen advisory committee. And that is very important for they can communicate between the citizens and also the police department. We have many citizens that do not have the trust, you know, 100% into the police department. So therefore, a middle man or a third person can help to bridge that gap. Uh, doing that, you know, that will help to decrease crime because the citizens have a whereabout where they can feel comfortable in talking to someone that is non-government and tell them exactly what's going on in the, in the community. Uh, many times citizens turn their back and they're scared to say anything, but they have a third person they can go to, and it, which is not government, that they feel more comfortable reporting crimes and crimes will decrease. All right, Xavier. Yeah, I would say, first of all, we need to focus on education, promote education a little bit more than we are, and it should help lower the crime rates because as long as um, everybody's going to school and focused on trying to get occupations and stuff, um, it, you know, give them less time to, you know, worry about crime. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, police body cameras is our next topic. Starting in 2015, Mobile purchased 500 of these cameras for officers, yet earlier this year there were Two police shootings, deadly shootings, in neither case was an officer involved wearing a camera. Since that time, the city has purchased hundreds more in the name of transparency, and yet Mobile Police, in almost all circumstances, will not make this video available to the public or uh, to the media. What would you recommend that the rules be for body cameras and the availability of the video? Xavier, you're first. Um, I think that we should all that they, that the um, police officers should wear body cams and um, they should be on at all times. And yeah, when there's something going on that they that the video needs to be seen, they should go ahead and release that. Thank you, CJ. Unless it's extremely graphic, I believe that the video should be released. Um, again, we have to realize as government how those body cameras was purchased, and it was purchased through taxpayers' money. So therefore, if that was to go ahead and cool down the taxpayers and the citizens in the community, just showing a video to see exactly what had happened, I believe that we, the government, should release those videos. Yes, sir. Thank you. Next topic is annexation. Uh, two years ago, for the first time ever, the city council voted against allowing a group of people, in this case about 13,000 people living west of the city, to vote on annexing into Mobile. The majority of those residents are white. The vote against annexation was on racial lines. Do you favor annexation? CJ, you're first. 
Yes, at the appropriate time. Um, I have to represent the citizens of District 3. And many times citizens of District 3 feel like they are left behind because of the lack of streets, um, the condition of them, the parts, the condition of the parts, um, the condition of many infrastructure issues that's around District 3. Many citizens in District 3, especially east side of Mobile, feel like that all the attention is taken you know, towards the west side of Mobile. So therefore, I have to show the citizens of District 3 why I voted for annexation. And believe Jan, for me to just to say, you know, I voted for annexation, they still left behind. We're not receiving no type of hope for tomorrow that their infrastructure and their parts and their streets would get better. That was hard for me to cast a vote. Uh, within the past couple of years, the city has invested a lot into the district. So therefore, it gave me a little more lead room to vote for annexation, which I do believe that the city do needs to grow. Okay, thank you much, uh, very much, CJ. Xavier, your thoughts on annexation? Yeah, I, th I would agree with it, but it has to be for the right reasons. Again, um, as far as I'm concerned, if it's for revenue purposes, then yes. If it's just for expanding, just to add more people, well, we could, you know, we have enough problems already in the city, so we wouldn't want to add extra people and need to have extra services when we can't afford it. Okay, thank you. Next topic is the supermajority. Mobile's government is set up so that a supermajority, five of seven votes, are required to pass most city council business. The system was established to protect African American rights, with four of seven districts being majority white. After this next census, however, when the districts are redrawn, we could have four districts that would be majority black. If so, should the supermajority remain in place? Xavier, you're first. Um, I, I kind of disagree with keeping it in place, but if it's for the better, then I guess so. Okay, CJ? Yes, we should keep the supermajority in place, and the reason why is they bring everyone to the table to make sure we negotiate. Uh, if we do not negotiate, and it's just always, you know, fair on one side, then the other side would not have the opportunity. And who knows when the census, you know, comes, it, you know, it could flip. It could be majority white. So therefore, you know, we supermajority bring us to the table to negotiate to talk about things and not just let things just be one-sided and we'll just be equal okay thank you very much next question involves inclusion and diversity has the current administration done an adequate job of representing the diversity of the city in its appointed position cj you're first uh at first i would say no um in the recent years and this past term i would say yes the administration have been trying to make sure that the um, his um, it, it is diversified. The law states that the uh, administration should you know look like the makeup of the city. I mean that's just that's a state law. And at first in the first term of the current administration it was not, but the second term is it's kind of going that way. And uh, I believe that you know this current administration will try to continue down that path. All right, very good, Xavier. Yeah, I think they're doing a pretty good job. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to talk now about uh, your favorite historic figure. Mobilians over more than 300 years have made their mark in a number of fields like medicine, aerospace, sports, and entertainment. Who is your favorite Mobilian of all time and why do you admire them? Xavier, you're first. I'd have to pick the Councilman Fred Richardson. He's been on council for 20-something uh, years and I think he has done a good job and I think he's a good role model for us. Okay, CJ? I would say Senator uh, Figures, the late M Michael Senator Figures. Uh, I respect him a lot. I didn't have an opportunity, to, you know, not to meet him. I uh, didn't meet him, but I heard so much great things about him, and especially the current law that Mobile is under. Uh, he was one of the lead, you know, ones that was leading that particular law that made, you know, African American have a voice at the table. Um, I have several other ones, but the one that's on top of my head will be the late uh, Michael Figures. Thank you very much. Next question involves the uh, mayor's race. Who will you vote for for mayor? Who are you endorsing and why? CJ, you're first. That is a hard question. Uh, all three of, the, uh, three of the candidates are close friends. Uh, one even is you know, my attorney. And um, I, <laughs> I, I, I have not endorsed neither one. And, um, and I have not really made up my mind. Okay, Xavier. Yeah, um, I'm going to be voting for Fred Richardson. He's been on the again, like I said, he's been on the council for over 20 something years, and I think he has the best experience for our city. And I think he'd be good new leadership for us. Thank you very much. 
All right, next question involves COVID-19. Have you been vaccinated for COVID-19? If so, uh, or if not, why? And how do you think the city really has uh, responded to the pandemic over the last year and a half? Xavier, you're first. I haven't been vaccinated yet, but I'm still weighing my options. And um, more than likely, I will, though. Okay, and uh, CJ? Uh, yes, I have been vaccinated. Uh, the city as a government has really had done well um, in trying to get the information out uh, to the citizens of Mobile um, by even, you know, trying to subsidize, you know, barbershops and beauty shops, you know, and try to make, you know, vaccines available and also the uh, COVID tests available to the you know, citizens of Mobile. So if I had to give a grade, I would give the government of Mobile an A. All right, thank you. This next question is also related to COVID. It, it's about the city pay raise for employees. During the pandemic, no city employee missed a paycheck. Mayor Stimson is proposing giving city employees a $5,000 bonus out of the city's CARES Act money. That's the federal COVID money. Do you agree with that? Or do you think the fund should go to others more impact by the pandemic, say business owners who may have lost their business or people who lost their jobs? CJ, you're first. Yeah, if you look at the uh, current budget, there are some money that is going towards small businesses. But I do agree, given the employees, um, their extra bonus. Again, you know, they had to sacrifice, you know, still meeting with, you know, some of the public and especially uh, officers and the firefighters and the public works. And uh, then they had to, you know, meet with the public, then go home and, you know, jeopardize and taking the virus back home to their families. So therefore, I think we, that we should reward our um, first responders, our public workers and our city workers for, you know, coming to work uh, because some, you know, so many people, uh, you know, did not have the opportunity to just say, hey, I have a choice to go to work. I do not have a choice to go to work. But with them coming to work every day and, you know, smiling and making sure that the cities move forward, I think we should reward them. All right, Xavier, your thoughts on the uh, city pay raise? Yeah, I believe that these uh, first responders and everybody should get a pay raise as far as the bonus goes. Um, that should go to, you know, those businesses and stuff. But as far as our first responders and those that did not have to not work during the pandemic, I think they, um, I think they deserve a raise. Okay, thank you very much. The uh, current administration, as we keep talking about city finances here, has built up a surplus of tens of millions of dollars over the last eight years. How do you balance the need for a rainy day fund with spending money that's being collected now from taxpayers now for current needs? Uh, Xavier, you're first. I would say keep the keep that what we already have as surplus. Keep that for the rainy day and use the other funds for the stuff that we need done. All right. Keep C that back. I'm sorry to interrupt. Were you done, Xavier? Yeah. Okay, uh, CJ? Uh, yes, we sure have a rainy day account uh, established. And, you know, today we are in good financial sound with the city of Mobile, you know, versus other cities, you know, throughout America. Um, so we are, do have some issues in certain parts of the city where we do need to address. And I would not just say, you know, there's this pat, pat, pat money, but we need to take some of that money. I would just say probably five to 10% of it and put it into areas, you know, throughout the city that is, you know, that is needed. But again, we do need a rainy day fund. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's talk about the CIP or the Capital Improvement Plan. It uses money from the penny sales tax, divides it evenly or a portion of it evenly among the seven districts for infrastructure projects. Is this fair to the older parts of the city? What changes, if any, would you make to this plan? CJ, you're first. Uh, yes, I am one of the sponsors for the uh, CIP uh, that really had came up with the CIP uh, program. And it has been a blessing for the city of Mobile you know, the question is, is $3 million fair enough across the board? And according to state law, you know, money needs to be evenly divided. And just as well as so we have a rainy day fund where we probably can just pinch off a little bit, I believe that the mayor has the authorization to go ahead and put some of those funds where it's needed, especially on the east side of Mobile. All right, Xavier? Well, yeah, I, um, yeah, I think that, it, that that's a good idea. All right, thank you so much. Uh, staying on the topic of uh, the CIP, let's talk about your district priorities for the CIP money for these infrastructure uh, plans. Xavier, you're first. Transportation for number one and um, try to speed up some of the constructions on some of the roads we have that we've already been working on and some that's been lasting for years and stuff. Go ahead and try to pay those off and get it done. All right, CJ? Yeah, the CIP money can only be spent on capital um, projects. Um, that's just within the district. 
And so therefore, the uh, first round of CIP that I received was to redo and uh, redid and straight. Uh, the second you know, round um, I received was to, do, to redo Baltimore Street. And so lately, you know, I've been focusing a lot on parks that has been really neglected throughout the years because of the lack of funding uh, in the district. Uh, district 3 have the second most um, parks in the city. I, I, we have like a 12 parks. And so taking $3 million is, you know, is not, you know, almost like chunk change, you know, between 12 parks. But that was exactly what I would do, is continue to do the parts, continue to do different streets throughout the district. All right, you read our mind here, CJ, with our next question. It involves parks. Does Mobile have enough of them? Are they properly equipped? Are they properly maintained? And how about in District 3? CJ, you're first. Uh, yes, again, uh, the parks has been neglected for several years, again, because of lack of funding. And thank God for the CIP. Um, majority of the parks have been um, have been touched, and we are going to continue to touch on those parks in the next four years. All right, Xavier, what do you think about parks in general and parks in uh, District 3? Well, uh, yeah, I think our parks could use a little more, a little facelift. We okay. could add some more, do not reactivate our pools and stuff for like in the summers and things like that, but other than that, yeah. All righty. Uh, next question involves litter in the city. It's a problem citywide. What can be done about it? How big a priority? Uh, should this be Xavier you're first well the littering problem is kind of a tough one but um we just need to encourage people to use the bins that we put out and um just show that you know just do our, do our best to keep the city clean okay cj yeah we need to continue a great litter campaign uh, not only just in the district but throughout the city of mobile uh, we have several you know bodies of water we have dog river uh, we have mobile bay we have um, Three Mile Creek. Uh, we have different watersheds throughout the area. And again, when we have citizens that come throughout, the, you know, in the city of Mobile, and they see trash, you know, just flowing, it do, it's not a great look. But if you have a citizens that come through Mobile and see how beautiful it is and litter free, we can gain more attraction of visitors in the city. All right, thank you. Let's talk about the Bayway Bridge project. What should the city's role be in the construction of this new Mobile River Bridge in Bayway? CJ, you go first. The city role should be the biggest cheerleader for it um, because when people come through Mobile on I-10 and they be backed up in that traffic, you know, past Michigan Avenue, you know, they're not going to say the state of Alabama. They're not going to say Baldwin County. They're not going to say Mobile County. They're going to say, you know, Mobile, that's a hard place to travel. You got to wait. Then you got to wait. So the city should be a cheerleader, you know, cheerleading towards the state of Alabama for money, cheerleading towards, you know, Congress, you know, the federal for money. Um, we should be the biggest cheerleader than anybody else. Okay, Xavier? Yeah, I think that we should um, support the um, Bayway Bridge as long as, you know, you don't toll the, um, the tunnels that we have going that way. Other than that, yeah. All righty. Uh, next question involves an occupational tax. For the last 15 years, the city of Mobile has invested more than $200 million in economic development projects, yet a majority of workers at Airbus, Austell, and the steel mills live in Baldwin County. Some say that Baldwin is booming off the back of Mobile. Should there be an occupational tax? The city of Birmingham has done this for example, to try to recoup some of this investment. Xavier, you're first. Yes, I do agree with the occupational tax for those who live outside the city yet work here because it's better for them to put money back into the city where they're getting the money from. Okay, CJ? Uh, yes, that was a discussion that we had discussed a couple of weeks ago in city council meeting. And from my knowledge, what we had got from the attorneys is that there is a state law that's prohibit mobile for applying you know, for occupational tax. I believe that we should talk to our local delegation to see that, you know, by doing a study about trying to do an occupational tax, because again, a lot of people are moving, again, the jobs here in Mobile, but they're moving to Baldwin County. All right, thank you so much. Next question, should the, uh, what should the role be of the city in financially supporting entertainment and sports events like college bowl games and classics, the Moon Pie Drop, or an event like Bayfest that no longer exists. CJ, you're first. Fun bring money. If you having fun, the family's having fun, they are spending money. You know, you, you know, Saturdays you go to Chuck E. Cheese before the pandemic. It used to be packed every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday because they are, you know, fun. 
you know, where there's fun, people are going to have a good time, just like the casinos. I mean, adults go to the casinos to have fun, and they're spending money. You know, so if people are having fun, they're going to spend money, and I think that Mobile should lead the way and let citizens having fun for they can spend some money. All right, Xavier. Yes, I do agree that we should uh, support having city-sponsored uh, events because, um, yes, like uh, CJ says, it does bring money to our city. All right, thank you. Uh, talking about bringing people to the city, tourism. The city supports Visit Mobile to the tune of about $2.7 million a year. COVID threatens the future of the convention and meetings industry. What should the city's focus be when it comes to tourism? Xavier, you're first. Just try to make it, because of the pandemic, just try to make it safe, but, um, you know, continue as we were and add more activities to these buildings and things like that. All right, CJ? We have a treasure here in Mobile. And, uh, and pretty much I say Mobile all the time is a you know, well-kept secret. You know, many people don't know that, you know, Mardi Gras is the birthplace right here in Mobile. And we know that Mardi Gras is one of our biggest economic, you know, boomers here, you know, in the city. And therefore, we also have another treasure here that we're trying to wake up, which is the Africa town, where the last slave ship was founded. And long as we put money behind the tourism, and especially at Africa town, where we can say this is where the last ship has landed, and that will bring all types of people into the city of Mobile, just like in Montgomery. In Montgomery, they have the lynching museum. And it's not, you know, the real thing. But you have people all across America going to Montgomery just to view this. But we had a real thing right here. And Mobile should lead the front way, and not just only pushing Africa Town, where the last slave ship had, was, you know, ended. Um, but we should also push, you know, our uh, water, which is uh, the Bayway, the uh, Dog River, um, and also Mardi Gras and different bowl games. All right. Next question involves uh, uh, Golf Quest. The city spent about $43 million. It has not been a success. It is a world-class facility, no doubt, but it has not gone over well with the public. What should the city do with this property? Keeping in mind, there are some restrictions owing to the use of federal uh, transportation funds. CJ, you're first. Yes, a couple weeks ago, uh, Representative Barbara Drum and myself had hosted a chat and chew where we invited the seniors you know, in our district down to Gulf Quest, and we had lunch on the river. And it was one of the most beautiful things, you know, that the citizens, those seniors could have enjoyed, you know, especially, you know, during this pandemic. And it just the view was just beautiful. I believe that we should really talk to the legislators and try to push, you know, casinos here into Mobile, not saying that I'm a gambler, but, you know, we have many citizens leaving Mobile, going over to Mississippi, spending their money. And we have a beautiful facility that we can use there for gambling. As long as, you know, Alabama passed the gambling law, we can have a beautiful casino right there, you know, in the city of Mobile, showing our beautiful waterway and wild gambling and also uh, having dinner and entertainment. All right, Xavier, your thoughts on Gulf Quest? Well, I think Gulf Quest, the Gulf Quest Museum could be used for a transportation hub, you know, for boats and ferries and also the Amtrak if you could use it for such things, but uh, yeah, I think it should be used for transportation. It'll help bring um, our tourists. All right, thank you. Next topic is the Civic Center as we stay downtown with our topics here. When uh, Mayor Stimson came in eight years ago, he said the Civic Center was obsolete. It couldn't be renovated in a financially viable way. It was a drain on the city's uh, finances, but that facility remains open, hosting few events outside of Mardi Gras. What do you see as the future of the Civic Center? And if you think it should be torn down, what would you like to see happen to the property? Xavier, you're first. I don't think it should be torn down. I think we should keep it here and um, just find other purposes for it. All right, CJ. Uh, the uh, Civic Center, many people, million Mobilians love it. Uh, that particular center, you know, you have Mardi Gras groups and you have non-Mardi Gras groups that really love, you know, the Civic Center. I believe that we need to bring the people, the citizens of Mobile, to the table and see exactly, you know, what they want and just give them several options to choose from. All righty. Next question, CJ, you go first on this one. What is the biggest issue facing the city of Mobile? Why do you think so? What can be done about it? Uh, infrastructure <coughs> is the biggest issue and blight um, is, I guess I named two things, <laughs> but I'm just going to... Um, focus on um, blight in District 3. Uh, Mo District 3 is, you know, of course, is one of the oldest, you know, areas in the city of Mobile where many people have grew up, you know, lived, and even passed away. And you have so many houses that's there, that's air property, 
where the uh, residents or of the, uh, the family members are out of town and they're not, you know, thinking two or three times about the property here in Mobile. So therefore, you know, we need more of the city workers to go out and to identify these homes and these overgrown lots to make sure that they are known for we can contact those property owners and that they do not want them. If there's air property, we needed to move to the next step to find someone who will take care of them to make our community much better than what it is today. All right, thanks, CJ. Xavier? Yeah, I think our crime could be um, worked on a little bit. I mean, it's not it's so bad, but it is a good issue that could be, you know, worked on. All right, thank you. What's the biggest uh, problem, biggest issue facing your district, District 3? Uh, Xavier, you go first. From what I can understand, it's more of the transportation problem with the bus system. And um, their need to go back to the way they used to be before the pandemic, you know. All right, uh, CJ, biggest uh, issue in District 3? And again, it's blight. Um, infrastructure, we are working on the present, but again, it's, it's blight. And uh, many citizens do not know they need to dial 311 when they see an overgrown lot has started growing, especially that particular property has been vacant uh, for years. We have a issue again with the properties being our property. And then we have another issue where a lot of realtors that really don't care about the city of Mobile own these particular homes and just letting them um, do out. You know, blight bring about crime. Crime is built where blight is. So if we get rid of the blight, we can pretty much get rid of the crime. All right, well, it's time now for our uh, closing statements already. Each candidate will have one minute to make their closing remarks. Uh, we flipped a coin uh, to see the order here, and we decided that, uh, Xavier, you're first with your closing statement. Well, all I want to say is that I am new to politics, so, you know, but um, I am here to serve the people, and um, just vote for Xavier Cronwright, <laughs> for councilman. All right, yes, sir. CJ. And again, I'd like to thank you, uh, Peter and WKRG, um, the uh, League of Women Voters, um, for inviting us out and other sponsors for inviting us out on this evening. Uh, I served as councilman of District 3 for the past eight and a half years. I was appointed in 2012, I ran in 13, and I also ran in 2017. And I have accomplished many things, you know, while I has been on the uh, Mobile City Council representing District 3. And in the next four years, my plan on is to continue with great progress into the city. You know, and just not just in the city, but especially in District 3. Again, where we said that we had purchased, you know, different waterfront properties, uh, and we're going to make use of it. Uh, we have money set aside to go to the different parts throughout the area and streets, you know, in our area. And again, my focus is on to make District 3 a better place where things are happening. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much to Xavier Carnreich and to CJ Small. Thanks to the League of Women Voters, Mobile United and AFC Mobile for sponsoring tonight's City Council Forum. Now next Monday, we'll do it all again at 7 o'clock with District 5, followed by District 6 on Tuesday and District 7 on Wednesday. And then a week from Monday, we'll have our Mayoral Forum. You can watch that on WKRG. All of our forums will be archived on our website, WKRG.com, so you can go back and watch them again. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great night.